Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Last night, I sat down to catch up on Steve Donahue's slow tour of his bookshelves, the one filled with Penguin Books, which he presents book by book, one per day. Many of us Penguin lovers are in heaven. Right now, he's moving through a shelf full of ancient classics, and yesterday he talked about Hesiod, specifically the 2018 Stallings translation of Work and Days. I'll link to Steve's discussion below in the description box. His video made me pull out my own copy of Stanley Lombardo's 1993 translation of both Theogony and Work and Days to discuss it a bit here. The ancient Greek poet Hesiod was a contemporary of Homer's. Although his popularity has not remained nearly as strong as Homer's, Hesiod's writings are our oldest primary sources for much of Greek mythology. Addressing his 'er ne'er-do-well brother Perses, Hesiod in Works and Days seeks to teach us that an honest life consists of working hard to the end of one's days. In imitation of Hesiod's direct style, Lombardo uses some colloquial or contemporary language, a choice I sometimes find charming and sometimes resist. Let me give you an example. When the translator is introducing Eris, the goddess of strife, he writes, she's a mean cuss and nobody likes her, but everybody honors her, this ornery Eris. They have to, it's the god's will. Works and Days begins with an explanation of why life is hard, that is, why human beings now have to work for a living. Hesiod explains using a story. Zeus was irritated when a mortal man began stealing fire, and Zeus decided to get even. I'm going to give them evil in exchange for fire, said Zeus, their very own evil to love and embrace. And what is that evil? women. He sets out to create Pandora, the world's first mortal woman, out of clay. The gods give Pandora a beautiful figure, a host of feminine talents, quote, a bitchy mind and a cheating heart. She is then sent to a mortal human man, quote, where she is a real pain for human beings. In addition to Pandora, Zeus sends the mortal man a jar of gifts, Although he is advised against it, the man accepts the gifts. Out of great curiosity, Pandora opens the jar and outpours sorrows and evils enough to blanket the earth and fill the seas. Only hope remains in the jar. Why was hope in the jar of sorrows and evils? Was it supposed to be an antidote to the sorrows and evils released from the jar? I don't think so. While hope can inspire us to work for the future, it can also be dangerous. It can encourage us to deny the reality of what's happening around us, to avoid the truth rather than confront difficulties in a more effective way, to be completely unprepared for what's coming our way. Our modern culture often insists that we must have hope, but maybe there are times when hope keeps us from taking action in the ways we should. That still leaves a question, though. What does it mean that hope remained in the jar? If you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Anyway, the story of Pandora is similar thematically to the story of Adam and Eve in the Hebrew Bible. Eve, like Pandora, is a seductress who seeks more knowledge than God apparently wants humans to have. Like Pandora's God, Eve's God puts knowledge deliberately in her path, and both Pandora and Eve's quests for knowledge lead to the beginning of human sorrow and pain. There's one difference. The Hebrew God supposedly creates Eve to be a companion for man, while the Greek gods create Pandora to be a punishment for man. Hesiod suggests that the human fall from our paradise was gradual. At first, humans lived with Cronus in the Golden Age, where they had no need for work. All was provided for them by the abundant earth. 
this race of humans was replaced by the people of the Silver Age, those who lived with Zeus and spent almost their entire lives as infants. This race was replaced by people of the Bronze Age, strong, warlike humans who eventually destroyed themselves. The Age of Heroes follows, the time from which come the noble Achilles and Odysseus. And finally, we come to the Iron Age, where men must labor in misery and desperation. It's an age of deceit, disrespect, unhappiness. The best course is to fight evil through hard work and steady routines. Hesiod's generally snarky tone is beautifully summarized by what is perhaps his most famous quote. He states that his hometown is bad in winter, god-awful in summer, nice never. He sees poetry, at least as Lombardo translates it, doesn't have quite the same resonance today that Homer's epics do. Homer's exegesis of character is what makes his two epics so powerful for me. Hesiod's language is not as glorious, nor is his social analysis as relevant today. On the other hand, there are certainly historical reasons to read Hesiod. One is that he's shaped the way we often portray history as a golden age from which we've literally descended. Interestingly, we often pair the idea of a golden age with the idea that things were harder in the past, Our grandparents may have had to walk uphill both directions to school in deep snow all year round, but their world was a better one, or at least that's the story we often tell. Perhaps we've combined Hesiod's proposal that hard work makes a better life with his idea of a golden age. Lombardo's translation of Hesiod contains a marvelous introduction written by Robert Lamberton. I'm especially intrigued by a pair of facts Lamberton points out. In Theogony, the author introduces himself as Hesiod, a narrative style we don't really see in Gilgamesh or in Homer's epics, and one that's the precursor to modern first-person narration, as Steve Donahue alludes to in his video. In Work and Days, the author emerges as an individualized human being with a story and a characteristic idiosyncratic view of the world, in other words, as a character himself. Is he writing autobiographical work? When Hesiod speaks of his father and brother Perses, is he recounting the truth of his own life, enough that we can use the information in our efforts to understand Hesiod's background? In Work and Days, Hesiod gives Perses a long speech about his family and behavior. This is very much a constructed speech, which he never would have given in real life, especially since he's presenting family history that his brother would, of course, have already known. Instead, the speech is designed to be heard or read by an audience, given in a very performative way. In other words, as Lamberton says, not only Percy's, but Hesiod himself is first and foremost a fiction. Although it's tempting to take his words as accurate historical information, it's equally possible that his whole story of inheritance can, as Lamberton writes, very easily be imagined as pure invention a fiction that has no relationship to the real world. So, Hesiod uses some devices that work against a literal reading. They make for something almost universal or mythical in tone. But throughout his writing, Hesiod also uses very specific details that make his work have the ring of truth, of autobiography. Is the narrator the same as the poet? Not really. Are the facts that the narrator speaks the facts of the poet's life? We have no idea. The emergence of the individual narrator is a central development in Western literature, one that Lamberton argues succeeds in, quote, personalizing the speaking voice and inventing a narrator with an identity and a personality. Perhaps it is that construction that sparks the lyric poetry about to come on the scene, 
the sometimes almost confessional poetry of Sappho, for example. Theogony is Hesiod's other short epic, referring only to the meter, not the more modern meaning of epic, and it's an interpretation of the beginning of the world. The poem begins with a long introduction, which serves as an invocation to the muses to speak through the poet and tell the story of origins. Once the introductory hymn concludes, we begin to read about creation in terms that remind me of the Hebrew Bible. In the beginning there was chaos, the abyss. But soon the two texts part ways. Hesiod stresses the importance of sexual reproduction in the invention of the world. From the abyss were born Erebus and the dark night, and night, pregnant after sweet intercourse with Erebus, gave birth to ether and day. In fact, creations conceived without sex seem dangerous and evil. Then earth gave birth to the barren, raging sea, without any sexual love, says one line. Another reads, Sleeping with no one, the ebony goddess Night gave birth to blame and agonizing grief. A great deal of theogony is simply a listing of the generations of the gods and goddesses. Often it reads like a section of Genesis, but in Hesiod we get some excitement. Mothers and fathers mingling in love rather than just strictly begatting. This positive view of sexual reproduction reminds me of the civilizing effects of sexual intercourse in Gilgamesh. More on that in an upcoming video. Still, the misogyny in this book is pretty intense, so much so that I really don't want to go into much of it. I'll give you one example, though. They were stunned, immortal gods and mortal men, when they saw the sheer deception irresistible to men, from her race, the race of female women, the deadly race, and population of women, a great infestation among mortal men, at home with wealth but not poverty. It's the same as with bees in their overhung hives, feeding the drones, evil conspirators. The bees work every day until the sun goes down, busy all day making pale honeycombs while the drones stay inside in the hollow hives, stuffing their stomachs with the work of others. That's just how Zeus, the high lord of thunder, made women as a curse for mortal men. Hesiod gives pages and pages of clever advice, that is, advice that sometimes feels almost like satire or even mockery. Reading him, I thought of Shakespeare's Polonius and his never a borrower nor a Linder B speech. A few examples. Be sure to invite the fellow who lives close by. If you've got some kind of emergency in your hands, neighbors will come lickety split. But can folk take a while? Don't be tiresome at a potluck dinner. It's good entertainment and cheap at that. Gives a good girl, but gimme's a goblin. Don't piss standing up while facing the sun. And to continue the misogyny we've already seen, first get yourself a house, a woman, and a plow ox, a slave woman, not for marrying, one who can plow. Don't wash in a woman's bath water, which for a time has a bitter vengeance in it. Or my favorite, don't let a sashaying female pull the wool over your eyes. Hmm, wool, must go pull out my knitting so I can do some more effective sashaying next time. Thanks for joining me today. See you soon.